This is a production of Cornell University. It's really, really nice to be back uh, here to Ithaca again. Uh, and just to see so many old friends, uh, Rebecca Nelson, I'm looking at you right now. Uh, a couple other folks in the back of the room here too, uh, but also to make new friends too. Uh, and I just came from the meeting with the students and I really, really enjoy that. I, the students are, are always kind of, they, uh, they really, really, uh, you know, just get you, get you pumped up again and, and excited for the future. Uh, so today, my title is is, is advantages and uh, adventures in potato and sweet potato breeding. I've had to spend uh, 25 years in, and so I kind of subtitled this as some things I've learned over the course of of 30 years of breeding in my two favorite crops. And when I am kind of asked by commodity groups or growers, you know, oh, which crop is your favorite one? I say I love both potato and sweet potato, and I work 100% in both. Right. I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the standard thing you got to say. Um, uh, but what I, what I thought I would do today is just kind of share with you some things that I, I feel like I've learned a little bit or that have, have an impression on me uh, over the years. Uh, to a certain degree, as I stand before the Cornell plant breeding group, I sort of say to myself, well, you all know this already. All right. But I'm going to kind of apply it in my context, in my two crops and kind of give you some thoughts. But before I do that, I think it's kind of important for you to know what, what my mission is, uh, what our goals of, of our potato and sweet potato breeding programs are. And they're very, very simple, all right? We're a variety development program, all right? So that's, that's our number one mission is variety development. To do that, we conduct all types of genetic and breeding studies, and we incorporate conventional you know, specialty crop industrial and ornamental types in, in, in my sweet potato program, pretty much the same in, in potato. And we're using traditional and genomic based methods. We're using whatever tools we need to get the job done. Uh, so in certain cases, they're very rudimentary tools, but in other cases, they're very, very, very sophisticated tools. And I'll share with you with that. Uh, I really feel fortunate, and especially after coming to visit the, the, uh, the graduate students, is our role as a land grant university in training and professional development of tomorrow scientists. I think that's really critical. Uh, I think we all know that standing here, but we, we take it seriously. And I, I, I feel very fortunate to kind of occupy a, a small space in that area. And then the third thing, I guess, is, is provide opportunities uh, for farmers today and tomorrow. I've been along around the job long enough now to have known and continue to work with uh, kids of growers that have grown up to take over the farm. Uh, and I've seen them walking in the fields when, you know, they were just yay high. And now they're managing the farm themselves. And that, that's really a special place to occupy too. And, and to see that transition is really important. Um, so that's our mission. That's what we do uh, in, in my programs. And we take it fairly seriously. Um, here are the things that I want to talk with you about today. And they're, they're basically uh, one, two, three, four big pictures that I wanted to visit with you about and then share with you kind of how I see it in my programs and how I've learned. And those, those four topics are polyploidy, uh, transdisciplinary slash team-based research, and the importance, how important it has become. I, I'm very fond of saying plant breeding is now a team sport. If you, if you manage a large plant breeding program, you better be a team player or else you're gonna get left behind. Uh, change is constant. And if you don't like change, well, you better get used to it because uh, it's, it's gonna come at you from various ways. I'm gonna focus on change in my breeding programs, all right? And then the other thing here, which I am personally wrestling with, uh, I'm not so sure that Ed wrestles with it too much back there, but I'm sure he does, uh, big data and complex analytics. Uh, they're here to stay. Uh, and it, it, it's uh, learning how to manage it, learning how to synthesize it, learning how to make sense out of it uh, has been a constant struggle for us. Uh, it's really helped us a lot, but we still have a long way to go. So let me, let me, let me kind of pop into our first one is polyploid is an almost endless source of variability. Take these with somewhat of a grain of salt, all right? It doesn't apply for everything. 
uh, but this is my perspective. I start off my talks very often with growers uh, when I'm talking about sweet potato is uh, this is a, a, a field of sweet potato, nice, vigorous vine. And if you get lucky and you dig that crop, you dig off a nice, a nice crop of orange flesh sweet potatoes. In this case here, Walter, this is Covington. Uh, and we're proud of that variety. Uh, but I say to you that sweet potato is so much more uh, than what we know in the South as the orange flesh uh, varieties. They come in a really, really wide range of colors, shapes, sizes, flavors, textures, et cetera. Uh, so we've got the orange fleshed ones, you know, up here. We've got purple flesh. We actually just released two new purple fleshers, which I think are going to be a pretty big hit. We have a lot of, lot of interest in them. Uh, we've got the staple types, which are predominantly grown in across sub-Saharan Africa, white fleshed, high starch, low sweetness varieties, really, really important. More and more, and this is where it comes from my experience as a potato breeder. Uh, in potatoes, you've got all kinds of value-added products. When I started my job as sweet potato breeder 25 years ago, very few value-added products, all right? But we're adding value to sweet potato now in ways that we have never done before. Uh, probably the one that you're most familiar with, certainly I'm most familiar with, it changed my breeding program, uh, is the sweet potato french fries, all right? Uh, but they come in all kinds of shapes and colors. I'll touch base on this in a little bit. This is uh, Ipomoea batatas. This is all batatas here, right? These are ornamental sweet potatoes. They're bred using conventional means, uh, conventional crossing, using crossing strategies we'd never use in table stock sweet potatoes, but to develop ornamental sweet potatoes. And I would argue that that's a consequence of polyploidy. We've unleashed remarkable gene combinations and selection allows us to go in the direction we want. So we'll talk about ornamentals in a little bit. Uh, we're making vodka. I know that up here is a, is a big distillery area too. Uh, this is Covington Vodka. I love the little nometer down here. The best yam vodka on earth. All right. Now, sweet potatoes are not a yam, of course. I'm not going to go into that today. But it, that's great. And I am sure that there are people in this room that are uh, our dog lovers. And more and more, uh, you're going to see uh, pet foods that one of the primary ingredients is going to be sweet potatoes. All right. And you're going to pay, you know, 50 bucks for a 25 pound or a 40 pound bag uh, for the sweet potato enhanced dog food. All right. So there's a lot of opportunity for our growers in those areas uh, and in the value added areas. Uh, the thing that really surprised me with sweet potato, and I'm really, I'm really pleased on this one, and I, I'll touch base on it briefly. This is also sweet potato right here. These are ornamental sweet potatoes. Uh, these two young fellows are me some time ago, and, and a colleague of mine by the name of Ken Pakoda. Uh, Ken did his master's degree with Dr. Wanda Collins at NC State in the sweet potato breeding program. Uh, he inherited me, and we've been working together for the last 25 years. I argue that Ken is one of the best sweet potato breeders in the globe, and I'd stand behind that, that argument any day. He's a really good breeder. Ken started the ornamental breeding program by crossing green, uh, regular table stock sweet potatoes with some lime green and some purple sweet potatoes that came out of the gene bank, we think from the Philippines, we're not exactly sure. He just started crossing these out of curiosity because he's a breeder and he wanted to see what they produced. Uh, polypoidy, crossing, and crossing sweet potato is very difficult. I won't go into that, uh, but unleashed a lot of unique colors, vine types, leaf shapes, that being in a horticultural science department, uh, we passed these by some of our colleagues and they said, oh, these are beautiful. They have ornamental potential. I have a little bit of a business perspective in me. We brought in a bunch of major companies to kind of look at these they got really excited about them. And uh, our initial little weekend and night sort of reading kind of job that primarily Ken drove and I kind of helped enhance it with some contacts and, and some business ideas grew into a full-fledged ornamental breeding uh, program. Uh, and now we're sponsored by Proven Winners uh, and uh, they support our research up front for the ornamental side. And on the back side, what they get is the, is the global rights 
exclusive rights to market our own ornamental sweet potatoes. Uh, our ornamental sweet potatoes, this is a picture of one of our fields a couple of years ago. Uh, we now probably have about five acres of ornamental sweet potatoes uh, that we walk and, and market each, each and, and kind of walk with Proven Winners team uh, to make our, our, our next selections. And I can tell you that the team really enjoys that because we're exercising, if you will, different breeding muscles as we're walking these plots. We're not digging the potatoes like I do for my other two, you know, for potato and sweet potato, uh, which is hard work and that's fun too. But we're looking for beauty. We're looking for vine color. We're looking for vine shape. We're looking for vine, you know, leaf shape, et cetera. Uh, and marketing that is, is a totally different endeavor. Uh, but it's led to this over the years. Uh, we've got 18 actively marketed varieties now. Uh, last count, they were in 11 different countries. We usually sell several, you know, five plus million units a year. Uh, and this is the palette. I can't, don't know how well you can see that. You can see it fairly well here, I guess. The palette of, of lines that we're looking at right now. And Walter's right, as I was walking down through the commons, this Sweet Caroline Bewitched Green is a pop plant there. And you're also going to see this other one up, up here. Uh, these two here, all in the mixed planters all, all around town. Uh, and it's, it's really, really fun to see that. This work has actually enhanced my table stock work because it's bring more resources to the table, but actually the original reference genome for sweet potato, the first reference genome that was created, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit, actually came out of our ornamental breeding efforts. Would have never have guessed, but we had a, a wild relative that we were working on that was sufficiently homozygous that we could use as our, our original reference genome. So that was an unplanned, uh, unplanned scientific output of these colorful varieties that we're, we're still continuing to develop. We've done about 30, but we're actively marketing about 18 right now. Okay, uh, I wanted to touch base on potato a little bit, and I wanna continue on this polyploidy theme. You remember this picture, Walter, you've seen this a lot, I think. Uh, what do you get when you cross a white and a purple potato, you get this. You get all colors in the spectrum. Uh, out of that one cross between a white and a purple tetraploid, two tetraploids now, uh, and you get this segregation at the F1 level, all right? That's phenomenal recombination for us. Uh, and variability that comes out of just that one cross. But the trick is, think about the, the opportunities in a cross like this. Functional food products, high in anthocyanins, some carotenoids, phenolics, lower glycemic index because of the starch makeup might be there. New flavors, exciting colors, different sugar, starch, and texture profiles, all in this segregating progeny right? Lower acrylamide levels, potential anti-cancer effects, right? The trick for me is, or the challenge is, how do you decide what to develop and how do you get there? Partly the CG partners that we have right now have this thing called a product profile, all right? Some of us have mixed emotions about that, that, that concept, but in this case, the concept is probably pretty important because you have so many things that you can go for. How do you choose what you're going to go for and what's the relative value and why? All right. Uh, so this is one of the dilemmas that I have as a breeder in my two crops is we generate in one cross at the F1 level, really significant variability. And every cross that we make generates that variability again and again and again and again. Uh, but if I want to develop a specific product profile, what tools do I use to go into that genre that I need to? In my potato breeding program, we have specialties that are coming out here, but they're, they're, they're low market value. They're, they, 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 they won't make a big hit. But if we can develop a new chipping variety with good yield, high specific gravity, resistance to internal heat necrosis, uh, and has a, a good size profile, that's gonna go someplace. Uh, so that's the challenge here, all right? Now, the last slide in this sort of set or this set of thoughts, if you will, is going to be this right here. And I have it for sweet potato and then I have end potato question mark. But these are our breeding objectives 
for sweet potato breeding. Uh, and the thing that jumps out at me really quick here is, oh boy, that's a long list to put together in one cross, right? To have all of those traits line up uh, in one cross is really almost impossible. Okay, so you work at building parents up that kick out favorable progeny that have the right attributes. But generally for us in potato and sweet potato, we have a whole long line of traits that need to line up just right to make it the next new big variety. Now, there are a lot of things in here that are kind of minor, right? Uh, but there's a lot of things in here that are, that are really major. Uh, you know, for example, drought, heat, flood tolerance is becoming more important. I've never met a grower who doesn't value yield, all right? Yield is always king. Uh, I've never met a, a processor who isn't more focused on the chemistries. Uh, for potato, it's all about gravity and, and a couple other things. Uh, and, uh, you know, most consumers are interested in the flavor characteristics. So it depends on what your product profile looks like that you're going to go for. And some of these are going to be really important. We have the disease and insect resistances. Fusarium resistance is a must-have for us. Root knot nematode resistance is, is a, is a must-have now. Uh, and the, the terrible thing about this here is any one of these traits, you could have an otherwise really, really good variety. But any one of these traits, maybe not any one, but a good proportion of these traits, for example, flavor, might fail in that one, you might have an otherwise really good variety, but if it doesn't have the right flavor characteristic, it might totally fail. Or in storage, as you start to ramp up your quantities, you pick up that you actually are susceptible to fusarium, it'll knock the clone out of consideration. Uh, so these are the things that we wrestle with as potato breeders and sweet potato breeders in when we're developing new varieties. We have to put all of these things together, uh, that pick it from that variability, and, and hope that we can combine a good portion of these into, into one package to make our next new variety. All right. Okay. The other thing I want to touch back base on that I've really learned a lot from and I've really, really, really enjoyed is transdisciplinary team-based research is, is, is required for, for success. And, and here I'm going to, I'm going to kind of reach into uh, a project that I had the, the pleasure of working on and then one that I managed this is the sweet potato action for security and 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 uh, uh, and, and health in Africa, Sasha, uh, and it was funded by the Gates Foundation, managed by the uh, International Potato Center. Uh, I managed a project called the GT4SP project, Genomic Tools for Sweet Potato Improvement Project, for five years with the foundation, and then these two projects got sort of morphed into a new project called Sweet Gains. Gains stands for genetic advances and innovative seed systems. That would be the gains part. And now we've recently been all combined together, all the RTB crops into a RTB breeding program. Roots, RTB stands for roots, tubers, and bananas. Uh, but I spent a lot of time building teams for marker-assisted, genomic-assisted breeding in sweet potato under the GT4SP project and the sweet gains project. And I wanna tell you about that just a little bit. And actually the story starts here. So as part of, of, our, of our work in trying to build genomic assisted breeding platforms for sweet potato, we realized that one of the things that we really needed was to put together a team of scientists with relative, relevant expertise across the disciplinary, disciplines of you know, genome, genome development, all right, uh, bioinformatics. Uh, we didn't at that time have a good genotyping platform for sweet potato, so we kind of had to build that. Uh, we knew that as you're putting all these components here together, uh, you need a database platform. Uh, so we, we, we reached out to Lucas and his team to build a database platform. Uh, our analytics became very, very complex. So we developed an analytical team, uh, both on the database side and the statistical side. And then we have the breeders at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, making populations and, and working with the rest of the team up above. And so what I really learned from that is the importance uh, of a team in helping the whole project achieve its goals. In my experience, and I'm not saying there might be a 
few of you here at NC at, at Cornell that are doing this fairly well. There's very few people that can have their feet in the ground, walk behind a tractor, make selections, and can go home in the afternoon and do all the bioinformatics. Or, you know, take a, a, a SQL file down and, and, you know, just kind of parse it and, and pull out your SNPs. Uh, the engineers that we're working with nowadays uh, in terms of optical engineering uh, are just, just phenomenal. So it's all about finding a good team that works together, that uh, is, uh, is good at sort of sharing knowledge and they can see the big picture while focusing on the important details. Now, I was very fortunate to find a number of people, some here, Zhang Junfei, Lucas, Sean, I think are in the room with us right now uh, to help us develop uh, both, both our, our reference genome for sweet potato. Uh, first reference genome was based on, I'll go over here, then maybe I'll come back, was, was based on Ipomoea trifida, a wild relative, diploid wild relative, of sweet potato, like I say before, it was actually an outcome of a breeding project for our ornamental breeding program uh, that just happened to come up at the at the right time. Uh, we have gone through the Trifida phase, high quality, very high quality reference genome for Trifida. We now have moved on to the hexaploid uh, genomes over here, and Zhang Jun and Sean have pretty much driven that effort. We we now have three complete genomes, I think. Tanzania, Beauregard, New Kawogo, but it's all built on Trifida and our knowledge as it expanded. What we, we couldn't do the hexaploid reference genome 10 years ago, but we can now. Uh, and that really set the stage for, I'll go back, marker development. All right, so we had a bioinformatics team here. Uh, that helped us set the stage, now we can order our markers, we know where they are. We can develop markers fairly quickly. Uh, this helps us a lot in the breeding population. Uh, we have assembled, this is the Tanzania and the new Kawogo. This is the Beauregard, Tanzania, new Kawogo next. Just some of the assembly statistics that we have for that. So these are high quality reference genomes at this point. And with the help of, of Robin Buell, who started out this project at Michigan State, moved down to, uh, to uh, University of Georgia uh, with her team, we now have a genomics resource that has become a global resource for the sweet potato breeding community. Uh, that has been very, very helpful over the years. All right, so that has been a really big sea change for me in, in terms of putting a team together that they understand their role uh, in, in variety development. I think that Sean and I talked yesterday a little bit and she says she really likes to work with breeding programs just because it, it serves a connecting point and it, it gives you relevance. You know, you're actually impacting society. And I, I think a lot of students in the room here probably connect with that too. I can provide that connecting point as the breeder uh, that's walking up and down the fields, but we need to access those tools to be successful. Okay, here's the other thing that I wanted to visit with you about. Uh, and that is the thing uh, is change is constant. And Mike, I visited with you just a little bit of, about this. In my own breeding programs, uh, we have to be prepared to change. We've changed our breeding program, I'd say fairly substantially, to try and better use uh, our genomics, better use just single gene markers in our breeding program. Uh, how do we implement genomic selection in our breeding program? At what stage in our program, in a clonally propagated crop, can we, get, can we begin to collect good data? good phenotypic data. Uh, that's really important if you're gonna embark on a genomic selection exercise because the quality of your predictions is directly correlated to the quality of your phenotypic, of your phenotyping abilities. And so we have wrestled with that over the years. I won't go into a lot of detail, but what, I, what you will see here is one, we used to work with several polycross breeding nurseries before. Uh, we used to work with really large populations. We'd go out with 60,000 single plants a year and whittle that population down very quickly over the next three or four years. Uh, these first two years, because of the size of our breeding plots, we didn't collect a lot of good data on them. Most of it was just making a selection and taking notes. So we weren't collecting good data. 
So we realized the value of that, and we gradually changed our, our breeding structure. We've gone from polycross nurseries to almost all paired cross nurseries. Uh, we no longer can do 60,000 seedlings. We're happy to do 25,000 seedlings. We realized that uh, in this cycle one, because we were getting basically no data, that if we went to three plant plots at cycle one, uh, that would prepare us with a larger planting population for year two, uh, where we could start getting accurate data. We could start phenotyping uh, better our materials and we can handle that. And now we can start genotyping in year two and pump those data uh, on our G, on our year two, year three, and year four data that we're gathering back into our models. And that's kind of what has happened with the sweet potato breeding program from that point of view. So we have changed the flow of our materials through the program. And we really recognize the value of good data collection. We'll touch base on that in a, in a little bit more on, on that. So that's been, that's been certainly consistent through my sweet potato program. Uh, same thing uh, with my potato breeding program. Now, Walter asked me the other day, what comes first, the potato or sweet potato, in terms of innovation, all right? And my answer back was, it depends. Uh, so our, our multiple plant plots was actually modeled on Cornell's breeding program. Uh, so multiple plants started in my potato breeding program long before it started in sweet potato. So we've, we've kind of, you go back and forth, both, both crops feed each other. This is what we used to do uh, on my potato program. We would go out with about 15,000 lines, single plants, uh, and you would, it would take a couple of years to get up to the larger plot size. Most of the decisions were made on appearance at this point here. Not a lot of data taken, but a lot of, a lot of appearance, a lot of sort of seat of the pants, which is valuable, don't get me wrong, uh, but it doesn't provide you enough numbers to make rational decisions. And then, you know, the data is where we got here. We've changed now. Uh, now we're, we're doing less than 10,000 uh, seedlings, but we're doing five plant plots, all right? That five plant plot here allows us to jump up quite a bit in year two. Uh, they, we're collecting our DNA from, from this section on here, and we're going out with multiple unreplicated trials in three different sites, eight plant plots, and we phenotype the whole population, all right? And so that has changed quite a, quite a bit. Now there's two things that I'd like to point out to you here real quick. And if you can see it from here, uh, that's a little bit simple, more complex. Sweet potato, same thing. We didn't make the job easier on ourselves. We made it more complex. There's no doubt about that in my mind. We made the job a little bit harder, but I think the output that we're getting is, is better. So in some cases, it gets a little bit simpler, uh, but in many cases, it got a little bit more complex for us, all right? Uh, this is the other thing that, I, that I'll point out here that I've learned that's really important. And uh, again, this doesn't apply to all breeding programs. It doesn't necessarily apply to my ornamental breeding program, all right? But my other programs, which are a little bit different, uh, this applies. Uh, what I've learned is operational excellence is really, really critical to our success. If we can't get the DNA collection done right, if we can't get the DNA timing sent off properly, uh, all of those little operational aspects of a breeding program, if we can't get those right, then we're, we're not gonna be doing a good job or it'll be suboptimal. So I've really learned the value of having SOPs, standard operating procedures, good operational uh, procedures in your program and a good flow of, of materials, all right? Back to teamwork. No one person can take care of all of that, right? So you're, re, you're relying on your genomics crew, your, phen your genotyping crew. You can get the DNA to them. They can get it dried. They can get center intertech. They can go over to dart tag. They can get back in less than a month, all right? Doing that is, is a big thing. Doing that on the continent of Africa gets even more complex, all right? Uh, so those operational things, uh, DNA extraction, genotyping and bioinformatics, phenotyping and the analytics, all really important, and we're all re relying on the team members to help us achieve that goal. Okay, let's finish up here with uh, big data and complex analytics, and I, I'll spend a little bit of time on this, I think. Uh, 
first of all, uh, we're breeders. And so we've made a lot of really good mapping populations. This is one of our, our marquee mapping populations. It's the Beauregard by Tanzania mapping population. I think I have a slide showing this in just a sec. But all of this is to show you that uh, being able to uh, make sense out of two complex hexaploids that are crossed at the F1 level is not an easy task. Uh, we're using modified forms of GBS, uh, just like you all are here right now for our SNPs. And we, we've got high density SNP maps of, of sweet potato that, that can map all 90 linkage groups, right? Uh, and we can pair the homologs together. So we, we, we know everybody that's, that's pairing together and, and that's worked out quite well. We've done a lot of QTL mapping in, in the BT population. We've identified QTL for beta carotene, dry matter, starch, glucose, fructose, sucrose, and more. I'll touch base on that uh, a little bit more. Uh, we've developed another population. So we cut our teeth on this one. This is the size of the population right here with the original QTL mapping exercise. Uh, we do read the maize literature, by the way, uh, and we developed our own form of a NAM population. This isn't like the NAM population exactly, but this is what we call the Mwanga Diversity Panel, which is an 8 by 8 dial -L population with 20 SIBs, about uh, 1,520 or so uh, size population. Uh, these are the, this is developed by uh, Dr. Robert Mwanga and Bernard Yada. Uh, at the International Potato Center and uh, the NACRI, uh, the NARO National Agricultural Research Organization in Uganda, uh, using mostly African land races and released varieties uh, in a large uh, diversity panel. Uh, this has now been phenotyped on many occasions. Uh, we're just concluding, we hope, the genotyping work on that. And the, the work that the team is going to do on this in terms of tracking traits through these materials, but also developing, uh, I'd say, genetic-based genomic selection strategies based on inheritance and pedigree. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what our team comes through for that, because this population is going to be sort of the forerunner of a lot of the analytical uh, genetic mapping work that the team is going to be engaged on. That's being led by this gang right here, primarily Xiaobang and Marcelo, and then Guilherme da Silva, who's at the University of Vicosa down in Brazil, is, uh, is a lot of the, uh, the new uh, GWAS and, and QTL mapping strategies that we're engaged in. All right. Uh, we have identified QTL for uh, beta carotene and a number of loci that are associated with beta carotene production. I was joking around with Bob and, and, uh, and Dr. Playstead and, and, uh, and Walter. Uh, in potato, the hot, the hot linkage group is, uh, Lucas, you know the hot linkage group in potato, right? <laughs> chromosome five. Yeah. <laughs> chromosome five is a big, is a big deal in potato. It seems like all the good loci map there for some reason. I don't know why. Chromosome three is, is sweet potato right here. Uh, and right there it is, is a major gene for beta carotene. All right. That happens to be linked with starch accumulation. So there are negative linkage. Ah, the cassava folks know this already, don't they? <laughs> yes. And we have broken that one, so don't, don't worry, you're, you're good. Yeah. We got high dry matter orange fleshers. Rebecca's saying, finally, finally. Uh, so we've done a lot of work in, in this area. Uh, this is before, this is the Tanzania by Beauregard Cross. Uh, Tanzania is, a, is an African land race, uh, does not produce any roots at all in North Carolina's environment but as a major land race in East Africa. Beauregard, so white fleshed, high dry matter. Beauregard, major variety in the US, orange fleshed, low dry matter. Uh, they combine nicely and we've done a lot of work on that. And this just kind of gives you a look at what segregation looks like in, in that cross right there, okay? So you get a lot of interesting uh, genotypes out of that. Uh, it turns out that Tanzania for my own breeding program, and this goes back to a question that, that the graduate students had for me is how do I integrate my breeding program, my international aspects of my breeding program, how do I sell that to my domestic commodity groups? Because there's a tension there occasionally. Uh, it turns out that Tanzania has great resistance to every nematode we've tossed at it. 
And we have two new nematodes that have recently come into North Carolina. One an old one, Melitogani incognita, a uh, southern uh, nematode, and a new one, uh, Melitogani in, uh, enterlobii, a guava root knot nematode, quarantine pest, causing lots of problems for us. Turns out that from Tanzania, we've got high levels of resistance uh, to southern root knot, Melitogani incognita, single gene, single dominant gene. This is what we all wish for in our crops, right? Even better, this is for Southern on linkage group seven. Uh, and then we have another one uh, on linkage group four for uh, Melitogyne enterlobii, uh, guava root knot nematode. Again, single gene dominant, high levels of resistance, both derived from Tanzania. Why they're there, I have no idea. But it, we have now been doing a lot of crossing. Uh, let me go back uh, using this in our breeding program to integrate those genes into our breeding materials and move them through the pipeline very, very fast. To do that, because we now have a great team on board, uh, we have been able to create CASP markers because we have a reference genome now, uh, because we can work with uh, Intertech on that and LGC Biosciences. We now have CASP markers that are fairly good at predicting resistance that we can use as markers. We're confirming those in other breeding populations. So far, it seems like it's holding up, but I'm, I'm kind of cautious here still. And so we're beginning to use these markers in our breeding program to facilitate our, our, our root knot nematode resistance work. This, by the way, is what Tanzania looks like in North Carolina. It's not very pretty, yeah. And the guy holding that is, well, he's not very pretty either. All right, uh, so these are the cast markers that we've now developed uh, in sweet potato. We have one for flesh color, uh, dry matter, skin color, firmness, and two for uh, enterlobi. Uh, we are validating uh, all of these right now. All right, but these would be the first use of marker assisted breeding in sweet potato in addition to our genomic work. Uh, the other thing that we've learned a lot uh, in our complex polyploids is that dosage matters. It's one thing to model a trait using a diploid model, but really, especially in sweet potato, even more so than potato, dosage matters. So when we have a SNP, we need sufficient depth, sequencing depth, to model that SNP's dosage in addition. Or if we make it into a haplotype-based version, we need to model that also. So all of our algorithms right now are predicated on that fact. In general, uh, it's more important for some traits than other traits. But in general, doses matters. And if we can get it, we will take it because it will enhance our predictability. It might enhance our predictability by only 0.1 or 0.2. But when you're down in the realm of 0.3 to 0.5, and you could bump it up to 0.4 or 0.6, hey, you'll take it. It helps me make better predictions. Uh, so that's a big deal that, that we have learned throughout the course of the, of the work. And again, I go back to that team concept. I don't have the skill set to do that. But our analytical team does. And I can ask the question and say, oh, I think this is important. We can model that. And that's the value of the teamwork that I have experienced. Uh, I, this is our genomic prediction models here so far. Uh, they have done well. Uh, some of our predictions, like the, I think it was the uh, the the H blup, uh, generally has given us better predictions across a range of traits uh, than than other formats. But this is an area that I think is is still really really uh, we have a lot of lot of work yet to do uh, in in sweet potato to realize this, and also in potato. And one of the things that that is uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop here and I'm gonna go. I think let me see here. Yeah, I'm gonna pop here. The other thing that, that, uh, that I've learned that is really, really important is when you're, when you're gathering lots of data, both phenotypic data and genotypic data, you better have a good database. And so fortunately, we've been working with Lucas Mueller's team at BTI. I know many of you are familiar with the breed base enterprise. Uh, I think we were the second base after cassava base. I think that's right. Uh, but it now is five or six different other crops here now. Uh, we have at least four breeding platforms that are actively using 
uh, we call it sweet potato based, all right, uh, across the continent in, in, uh, in Africa. And certainly my program here uh, uses it, you know, pretty much a daily. And this time of year, they're going out to the field and getting harvest and they're, they're, they're downloading their, cl their clones and accessions using breed base uh, on the fly in many cases. And, and using that as, as what we're doing for the day. We use it to construct our trials. Uh, we try to round trip as best we can. What we have found is that we need somebody with IT experience. Uh, luckily, Lucas has provided those over the years for us uh, that we can reach into them and, and, and kind of help them kind of work out all the bugs that will turn up and stuff like this. But it's been a big deal. Uh, going back to genomic selection, uh, this is one of the biggest things that I am wrestling with personally, and I don't think we'll solve that problem here. I'm just trying to be cognizant of time. Uh, a key issue that I'm wrestling with is going back to what I said earlier, a lot of traits have to align just right, uh, you know, to make a new variety. And we're all about varieties here, right? We want to build up a breeding population to make new varieties. Uh, but a lot of traits have to align. Uh, and I can't model all of those traits but I can maybe whittle it down to maybe four to six. And which four to six are the most important ones are gonna depend on individual breeding programs. But those are gonna be four to six traits that have to deal with field performance. Much of my success is actually based on culinary performance. So I've got a dozen more traits that I need to model for flavor or for sugar or for browning. Uh, and how do I kind of juggle those two together? We're still on that learning path right now. And maybe we'll talk about it later on in a couple of sidebar conversations of how to kind of wrestle with that. I'm still sort of struggling with that. How do, I, how do I manage that in my breeding program in the context of that? One last thing that I'll share with you has really been fun. Uh, and I think it's a game changer for us if, I can, if we can get it right is using, and I think this can translate to, uh, into the African context quite well too, is using optical imaging, machine, deep learning, artificial intelligence now to, uh, to model yield or to predict yield from storage routes data in the field. Uh, we have started out quite a bit uh, just using plot level. These are plot level images taken with our cell phone, actually taken with field book because field book labels all of our images with the barcoded and it tags in and we know what, where, where the plot came from and we have all the, all the metadata right there embedded in the code. Uh, our first thing was is to, is to mask the sweet potatoes. And then we asked our optical engineering and our computer scientist colleagues, uh, I wanna know the weight of each one of those sweet potatoes. I wanna know the count of the sweet potatoes in that plot. I wanna know the weight, I wanna know the length, I want to know the diameter. I want to know the LD, because those five traits are really critical for us in terms of selecting. Uh, so we worked with uh, a guy by the name of Mike Kudnoff and Kranos uh, Williams uh, in our Department of Computer and Science Engineering. Uh, we started off on this journey right here. We pretty much can show that we could do that. This one's a little bit messy. Our next iteration was flying with drones. So now we fly it with a UAV. These are, are you, can, you can see here, these plots are nice and ordered, right? They're kind of easier. These are dug with a sweet potato digger, with a, with a two row chain digger. And then we just fly it over slowly with the drone. Uh, and then we apply the algorithm that was developed earlier to mask these storage routes. And you can see it's doing a fairly good job. Soil type makes a difference. You can see on cloddy soil right here, might be a little bit harder, but it actually does a pretty good job. Uh, and so now the trick is, is converting these images into counts per plot, uh, weights of individual sweet potatoes, sizes of those sweet potatoes, and, and using that. Uh, we're getting a little bit further along here now. Uh, this is actually another test that we've been doing where we flew the field with a drone. These are actually bedded plots. They're gonna be used for seed but we're testing our hypothesis out that we can do this in the field. This is one of my graduate students who just finished his uh, master's degree, he just left for UC Davis to do his PhD. He's brilliant. Uh, flew the field with a drone, uh, individual plot right here. We can mask all that. Uh, we can segment that plot using this algorithm here. 
and identify individual plots in the field. And then this down here, it's hard to see, but this is the individual data coming from those. And those, you might ask, how accurate are they? Uh, this is our prediction for root weight, individual root weight. Uh, we had some data that was, that was entered in wrong when they were taking the physical data, right? We parsed those out. You can see that we've got an R square estimated weight versus predicted weight, which is actually doggone fine from, from that work there. Uh, and then I think, let's see here. Yeah, there's just this other one here. This is a storage root yield and shape. Uh, so again, root counts here. Let me go back. It's, this is a, yeah, data removed there and then root counts on here. So we're actually coming along pretty far in this one. And this year we're actually putting a camera on the back of our, of our digger. Uh, and it's actually measuring yield real time coming across the digger. We, we were trying to do that. We're going to see if we can do that. Going back to what I said here is where do we change the breeding program? Now we have to think about, well, how do we change our breeding program so that we can get this data? And I'm pretty much convinced because my gang is not going to wait for you to fly the drone and then walk the plots. We just can't wait like that, right? So my hunch is actually the data that we leave behind is just as important, if not more important, than the data we gather. So now we're sort of thinking backwards is we wanna know what we drop. We're gonna fly the whole field. We're gonna look at all of the population and we're gonna enhance our predictability by looking at what we keep, but also what we don't keep. Uh, and these new tools kind of allow us to kind of start to ask those questions. I'll, I'll finish up here now, yeah. Uh, okay, so I think as I, as I wrap up this thing here, this little little figure here sort of you know encapsulates some of my thoughts here we've done a good job of training people we've got next generation breeders on the ground starting to do really good work we have a lot more work to do here that's partly you know why why we're here got a good reference genome we've got great genotyping methods now well we've got better genotyping methods i think we need to work on that uh we've got phenomenal polyploid mapping and qtl analysis strategies that are that are down to pipe as a result of several projects all across the globe we've got some really good breeding populations being developed uh, and we've got robust database and electronic data capture we pretty much capture all of our data using you know field book app pretty much all, all of it's done that way uh, and and that's that's been really good so I, I think we've got the tools in place but it's the team it's all about the team that helps you know kind of drive things forward and with that uh, I'm just going to say this uh, polyploidy is, is, is a, just a quick recap for us. Polyploid is an almost endless source of variability, uh, but harnessing it is easier said than done. All right. Uh, transdisciplinary team based research is required uh, for success, uh, but teams can be hard to manage. Uh, but when they function well, boy, it doesn't get any better. It is really great to see people doing great things. Change is a constant. Uh, be prepared to continually change your breeding program and to grow, all right? Uh, and this last one here is, is big data and complex analytics are here to stay. I think I'm fairly secure in that statement. Uh, boy, but I need a better handle put on that toolkit for me to manage. So that would be my ask for the data folks here is give me a better, give me a better handle for my toolkit. It's a great toolkit. I just need a better handle on it. Uh, and the last thing that I'll say is it's really, 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 an exciting time to be a breeder. You got a lot of challenges ahead of you students, uh, but you you've got tools like you've never had before, and you've got great challenges. and And uh, I uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what you do. And I'll stop there. I'll thank some of our partners uh, on the sweet potato side, and some of our partners on the potato side, and uh, they kind of all make it happen. Uh, so I I I I, for, I forgive me if I've gone on just a little bit too long. Please ask at least one question, because if you don't get a question, then yeah, go ahead. Is there a hubbub in sweet potatoes like there is a potato for reducing down to diploid to do hybrid diploid to choose seed? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, th no, there's, there's not right now. Uh, but, you know, I, I, one of my, my responses is, is that one. What do you get when you, when you reduce a, a hexaploid sweet potato? You get a triploid. I mean, so I, I think that, that that aspiration is more logically put in potato 
and I can see that, but I, I don't see that coming in sweet potato. And I could go on for about the breeding systems and incompatibilities, et cetera, much more difficult in sweet potato than potato. Yeah, good question though. Yeah, saw somebody else around here. Yeah, very good. I was also asking, thinking about the whole diploid question. I mean, but with the powerful tools you now have, you know, you can drive GS fast enough and everything else. Do you really care if you had a, you know, even if you could make a, a diploid, would you want to do it? I honestly, I, I can't answer that question. And I think that some potato breeders are asking that same question too, to be honest with you. Yeah. I'm looking at it from both, you know, for me, I'm a, I'm a never put your eggs in one basket kind of guy, right? I'm a spread your risk. Uh, I'm, I'm anxiously waiting to see what happens on the diploid breeding side, excited about it. Uh, and I've offered ourselves as a phenotyping station. I don't have the resources to engage in that on the potato side. But I'm anxiously looking for some others to send me clones and see how they perform. Yeah, gene editing is a, is another thing. You know, we have new tools in gene editing if we can overcome some other barriers that are going to be used to enhance crop performance. I think that's a big deal too. But that's that's a ten year horizon for me at least. Yeah, and I don't plan on being around that long. Yeah, go ahead. Kanan, did I see a hand over here? No. Well, you're going to ask the hard question, aren't you? <laughs> Cast markers are so like dominant traits of sweet potato. How do you plan to use those? Do you plan to go HCPC has done in, in potatoes, plant a million seedlings, find the 50,000, have all the markers you want to implement those? I haven't figured that out yet, but but I do know that for say, uh, in my own breeding program for uh, root knot nematode, it's become a really important trait and it's really, really hard to bioassay for. Uh, so all of our parents are now going to have to have that marker uh, and we'll use that. On the potato side, we talked about it, uh, for the single gene traits, all of our parents are, are now having PVY, either ADG or STO, uh, and, and will enhance our parents for those values. Those other markers, we'll see where they come in due course. My colleagues in Africa might have a different value proposition and they use them differently. It's still too expensive uh, to do on all of your single, on all of your, your first cycle selections. We just toss away too many. So it's, it's kind of wasted money unless you're, unless you're focusing on parents. Uh, but we'll use them in our seconds and our third years because it's cost efficient for us. I mean, we, we can do them for less than 10 bucks a pop and we can do them in house too, if we want to, but it's easier for us to send them out to, to uh, Intertech. Yeah, Rebecca. Thanks so much, Craig. Um, good seeing you, by the way. Important to see. Yeah. Um, and good to see all this fantastic progress. Um, so you mentioned the importance of operational excellence. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's maybe the part of the handle of the toolkit that you're looking after. A, a few mm -hmm. years ago in this, in this room, Steve Tanksley made, I think, kind of a splash with us talking about how the math of operations thinking could be applied or how is being applied to, you know, pretty good style and, and in some breeding programs, you know, or in some of his thinking. I'm wondering, is is that school of thought pertinent to what you've been talking about or should it be or where we have? I, I, I think it is pertinent. I, I remember Steve giving a talk at PAG along those same lines and I was somewhat fascinated by it too. Uh, and, and in fact, we, we tried to recruit him as a, an advisor for one of our pro programs, uh, but he didn't have time. I, I think it's, I think it is, uh, it's relevant. I don't know that I put pencil to paper, if you will, uh, to sort of look at that point of views, but we have thought long and hard about at what point in the breeding cycle does it make sense? And what can we reasonably manage at that point, uh, given the resources that we have? Uh, we we kind of do it that way. I, I should say that I, we have embarked on an exercise, uh, actually on the potato side, where we're, we're starting to quantify all aspects of our breeding program, just out of curiosity. Actually, it's, it's in response to a, a breeding partner that wants to work with us and we wanna come up with realistic numbers. Uh, so we're starting to kind of do that, to kind of put it like, you know, how expensive is it for our second years? You know, what does that look like in terms of human resources and manpower? So we, we're starting with that and that might be a start for that. You start to look at it, it's damn expensive to run a, Large scale breeding program. Yeah. John Luke. Um, you had that slide with three or four columns 
full of traits that all mattered. Yeah. And uh, I won't go all the way back there. But... And so, so I'm curious, do, do you try to estimate an economic value for each of these traits? Ah, oh, that's a really good point. I mean, yeah. Simple, right. I mean, it, I mean, in animal breeding, they have at least 80, uh, in dairy cattle breeding, 80 traits that they pay attention to one way or another. Yeah. So it's, it seems to me that the number of traits isn't, isn't a killer. It's, it's this question of, do you believe that you have economic values that are meaningful? Yeah, and, and uh, that's a stellar question, actually. It, it, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like Walter shaking his head up here. Huh? Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, here's the way I think about that, and and it it, it might be totally irrational. Um, we sort of we sort of know what traits are the most value that 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 um, based on our interactions with growers and processors, which are fairly substantial. Uh, we sort of know which ones they value the most. And which ones will sink or or rise a new clone to the right, top so of the I'm list? About parents, I mean, I understand a new variety; it has to pass some thresholds yeah. or something. But your your parents don't. Right? No, but you're you're right about that. But the, but we will we will actively work to have high quality parents with with those high quality traits. The interesting thing is that that doesn't the best parents aren't always the ones with the best combination of traits. Would you agree with that statement? You'd be surprised at some of the dogs that give you some really good stuff. Uh, and you learn that through successful crossing and measuring their breeding value, maybe measuring them like I suggested, what we leave on the ground is just as important as what we carry forward. Uh, but the thing that, that, that struck me with your, your question there is fusarium, great example. Uh, in potato, uh, resistance to internal heat necrosis. Really, it's it's a it's a high value trait, but it's only expressed, uh, you know, in the south sometimes, and under high stress environments, heat and drought kind of bring it on. Uh, it's something that we can't measure real well, uh, but yet that one trait can disqualify an entire variety. That variety might be have great yield, great gravity, fry bright white. Uh, but in the south, if it expresses heat necrosis one or two years out of five, you're done. And it's tough to put a price on that, but that's the penalty you pay. And there are those, those traits that kind of sneak up on you as you scale to tractor trailer load sizes, to, to those sizes that we as breeders can't really, we can model that really well, but we can't really predict it what's going to happen at that scale as you scale up. And that's been the, that's been the, you know, that, that's brought us to close to tears on more than one occasion. Yeah, so those things kind of come up. I hear what you're saying. Uh, that, that's, that would be good, but there are all those other little things that, that sort of come up. Scab, you know, a big one, if you hit a scabby field or so. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Greg. So how long does it take to release a variety of genomic selection compared to the I can't answer that question because we haven't done that just yet. I'm hoping if I can reduce the breeding, the, the time to release a new variety by maybe two years, I think that would be reasonable. We're looking at uh, in sweet potato, usually a, a, if you're super fast, a six to eight year time horizon. Uh, potato, eight to 12, eight to 12. It is, and, and with a little bit of luck. So potato, a little bit longer. Just because of the seed propagation part, the scaling up part, sweet potato, we can scale so much faster. Uh, our vegetative index is, is so much quicker. We can, we, can, we can bulk up really fast. We can get ahead of things. Um, on potato, a little bit longer. So if we can knock two years off that cycle, if we can knock three years off that cycle, I think we'll be doing good. Uh, but I, I think we, we still need to test that. And where I really see the genomic selection working for us is, John, look like you're saying, parents, building better parents that, that kick out much favor, much more favorable progeny at a much higher frequency, uh, that are that that have better suite of traits that are sort of built together. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Your Mike. level of support really the same for each of these two crops. Ah, good question. No, uh, but we for both crops we have extensive. Uh, I'll take off the extensive. We have on-farm trials, uh, both potato and sweet potato. We're we're three to five on-farm trials a year 
and generally uh, those are done very close uh, with the grower. The grower will walk the fields with us. We're using all the grower's equipment. Uh, and in sweet potato, we're using the, the, uh, both the, the, his or her planting equipment, and we're also using their, their labor, which is a, which is, which is a big deal. Uh, and it, it has been a really um, valuable part of our breeding program in terms of keeping us connected, I think, in terms of understanding growers' perspectives, wants, and needs. But I think it's a two-way process in that the growers sort of look at it through breeding eyes, too. And they get a they get an idea on scale. You know what does it take? You know how 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 to manage it. That's that's been really good. Uh, so we're 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 out there every year. We we have on farm trials, uh, generally with the progressive growers too. They're they're usually the ones that invite you on, and they're they're interested in doing things and learning things from you. Yeah. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.